You're listening to Finding Joy in Education, the podcast that focuses on what brings us joy in the field of education. Each show, you'll hear joy stories from teachers of the year, educators from all walks of life and leaders, as well as hear hacks to enhance the teaching and learning in our classrooms. This is Finding Joy in Education. Hello, and welcome back to Finding Joy in Education. You are joining us today for episode two, which is Finding Joy Through the Arts. For our first segment today, called Toy Stories, we have in the studio, Dr. Dakian Chadre Graham. Dr. Graham, would you please tell everyone your story? My story? Well, I, I think it's great to start the fact that my undergraduate experience was at the University of Florida. Go Gators. Go Gators. And the reason that's where I have to start is because I actually went into school double majoring. I was a microbiology and a music education major because uh, I did had no intention of being a teacher. <laughs> Yeah, had no intention, right. but I but I loved Plot music. Twist. Yeah, <laughs> love me. I was going to be an anesthesiologist for eleven years. That way, you had one year that paid for malpractice insurance for the ten years of doing it, and then potentially become a high school band director. Um, but had a a but for moment mm. uh, with a student of mine that I was working with privately on, as a professional martial artist, mm -hmm. and it just changed the direction. So from there. Uh, went and started teaching. Actually, while I was in college, I was a music teacher teaching steel drums at one of our local elementary schools. Uh, it was Duval Elementary. Oh, wow. Uh, and then when I graduated with my master's, I got a call from my high school band director that said, hey, what are you doing next year? And I said, I'm looking for a job. And she was like, well, I'm leaving and opening a new school and I want you to come back and take over for oh me. Gosh. And this was the same teacher who told me my senior year when I was walking across the stage that I was not going to be a doctor and I was going to be a band director. And I was like, challenge accepted. And she <laughs> clearly knew better than I did. Um, but so taught at my high school for 11 years, uh, then had the incredible opportunity to be elevated to teacher of the year. And as you know, t had a year sabbatical, got to travel. I still wear the badge that I went to all 67 counties. Yes, he all did. 74 he put districts. us all to shame <laughs> making his rounds around the state. <laughs> um, and then from there, we know what happened March 13th. The state of emergency was declared. So travel all stopped. Uh, which and I had just made the last county on the on the fourth of March, so it was definitely a divine appointment. Incredible. Had an opportunity then with Commissioner Corcoran. He just from our opportunities getting to know each other, there was the availability to go and serve in the DOE as the executive director for school choice for the state. Did that for a couple of years, and then now uh, I'm back in Alachua County as the director of educational equity and outreach for, for the district. So I love it. I love all the flavors that you bring. <laughs> um, and so what Dr. Graham didn't mention is his, uh, teacher of the year was from Hillsborough County, so right over the bridge. And so he's got a lot of connections here to Pinellas County, but also, as you can tell from across the state, I think what I love most about your story is that it started with a connection with a teacher. Absolutely. Right. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about this profession is the connectedness that we have not only with our students and their families, but with the teaching community. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love that piece of being a teacher. Yes. So Dre, our episode is all centered on the arts. And so with your background and your experiences, I want to know from your perspective, how do you describe the arts bringing joy to education. So give me some examples of how you saw joy through the existence of art. Well, you know, it's funny the timing of us recording this podcast because there's the state conference, the Florida Music Education Association state conference is happening on the other side of the bridge mm -hmm. right now. And so we're seeing a number of teachers just flocking from all around our state to this conference looking for that reinvigoration of joy and who they get that opportunity, whether it be connecting with other teachers who 
are in their field, people who they graduated with. I sat through a board meeting this morning and realized that out of the 24 people sitting there, three of us graduated together from Florida in our undergraduate experience. So we like to say that we, we have like, we had a powerhouse graduating class, but just those opportunities to, like you said, those relationship pieces. But then I think back to my time in the classroom mm -hmm. and Friday night football. Yeah. It, it was our, our, our team wasn't like, wasn't really <laughs> strong at, at the time. And, you know, it's the coach there is, is doing a great job now of bringing that team back to a place where they're competitive, but people came to hear the band. Yes. And so we always made it a point that we did something called a filler number. So we would do our, our show for us that we we're getting ready for our, our evaluation, but then we'd finish with some radio tune or something that was familiar and the kids would put their instruments down and dance and they, we'd always have an impact move. So usually a split and the kids go, and then everybody goes crazy. And so they're all oh, shouting and the kids feel really good because they're getting that feedback back. Yes. Uh, but I think about times that we did, we performed at parades, which were not necessarily my favorite. I, I hated parades, mm. uh, much to the chagrin of one of my former principals, because he said, Dre, all I want you to do is get us to Macy's. And I said, I, I'll do you one better. I, I'll get us to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> and I said, we'll still go, we'll go to New York. We'll have this great experience. And I, I will tell you to this day, this man still comes. He's like, Carnegie was great, but, but I still wanted to go to Macy's. <laughs> I was like, Mike, I, I hate parades, uh, but they bring joy to other people. Absolutely. Um, and so, and I think about pep rallies and I just that, that performance aspect where music specifically, but the arts as a whole just has a way to connect and bring everyone together because it's a uniquely human experience. I think a lot of our core memories are tied to music, mm -hmm. right? When you hear something, it can bring you back to the exact moment. So it sounds like that's what you provide for students. You give them those opportunities to have those core memories and the community that is built around it. When you said Friday Night Lights, I literally felt like I was at a football game. <laughs> like I knew because I knew what you were talking about mm -hmm. and not as someone who performed in a band, but as a member in the stands. Right. I remember that energy. And so I just I love that that art gets to do that, that mm -hmm. music and art and visual and performing arts, they get to play that role in transforming the educational journey. So when we think about education, and so as someone who works in the arts, tell us a little bit about how you get collaboration among your school community to integrate arts into curriculum, especially for teachers who might be saying, I don't have time for that. So tell mm -hmm. us a little bit of how you address that. So I, I'll tell it from two different perspectives. Sure. So as a classroom teacher, who teaches music specifically, music in and of itself ties in so many other content areas. Mm -hmm. So I, I think about a lesson that I taught with a piece called A Movement for Rosa, mm -hmm. which is written about Mo Rosa Parks. Well, that directly ties into conversations with social studies when we start talking about civil rights movement and different key figures there. And so when I would teach that, I would actually collaborate with our social studies department so that we were working on teaching these different elements. And so now we're talking about other figures who maybe aren't those who are the commonly known ones, but who still contributed to the civil rights movement at the same time that our social studies department is covering it and being really intentional that we do that outside of the month of February. Yes. Yes. And so now we're, we're able to have that clear collaboration, which brings more relevance and applicability to the content area that the students are learning about. I think about the mathematical relations whenever I'm teaching music theory to all of my classes and understanding the, the way that the notes are related and your time signatures, but then also finding ways to incorporate music math, but in such a way that we're collaborating with our math teachers. Yes. Uh, you think about the same thing kind of with the social studies and that includes history. Mm -hmm. um, you, we had, we played a piece called Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, which is also a poem. Mm -hmm. And so being able to collaborate with our ELA department and really making that a, a lesson in which, hey, when are you covering that? We want to make sure that we are able to tie this element into our classroom because we're going to read the poem as well. What are some of the opportunities and the ways that the strategies you're using in your classroom that I can bring and identify, okay, we're going to do a close read here. Yeah. And, and I was going to ask, so, so when you do that, do you encourage those content teachers to come to you? Like, do you keep that, that communication? So it's like when you are doing this unit, come see me and we can integrate, or do you suggest to the arts teachers 
to make those relationships and seek that out. Yeah, generally I went to them. And and I think that's we have to take the first step sure. as music, as the arts educators mm -hmm. because more than likely there are fewer of us on a campus than there are others. Mm -hmm. And as as education professionals, oftentimes we get in this cave of, well, nobody else is doing what I'm doing. Well, that doesn't mean that we don't have elements that connect. Sure. And so one of the other ways that I would also incorporate other members of our educational community is I would actually, I opened my classroom up to be a laboratory classroom. Oh, okay. And so teachers would come in and we'd start talking about strategies. And we'd talk about the way that I do call and response. We'd talk about the structure of my student-led um, aspect of the classroom where my students are running the first 20 minutes of class before I even come up to the podium and actually do any type of instruction, whether they're, they're reteaching something we went over, whether they're reinforcing a, a concept. It's all student-led initially. And then we move to that either project-based learning or yeah. we're rehearsing. So that communicates and translates directly into any other content area. Sure. And I think about in elementary, like our music and art teachers, they see the whole school. Right. And w how often are we leveraging that expertise? Mm -hmm. we, we have our kids with us, you know, all day, but that's 20. Yeah. They're seeing 600, 700 kids a week. So clearly they have some tools in their tool belt that we need to tap into. So I love right. that you said that, that you opened up your classroom and let others come in and see that. That's so smart. So you talk about often being um, limited in arts educators at the site, right? At mm -hmm. school site. So what does collaboration look like for you? So if you don't have another band teacher on site, mm -hmm. who do you collaborate with when you're creating your lesson plans and how do you get other ideas? Well, that's the beauty of music educators is that we have our state organization uh, being a band director. We have the Florida Band Masters Association. We have the Florida Orchestra Association. I'm also an orchestra director. We have those state groups, but I know that within Hillsborough County, where I taught, uh, we also created this group. We gave ourselves the name, the Eastern Coalition you of Band Directors. Your names, hey, you I know, tell you, you name all your groups. <laughs> we do. We got <laughs> names. Got to be official. <laughs> um, but we would have our professional learning community meetings every Friday after football games at Ale House, mm -hmm. where we <laughs> we would we'd have those discussions about the things that are happening in the classroom. We talk about the way that we're approaching curriculum, different things like that. But I was also really intentional about collaborating with non-music teachers as I'm developing my lesson plans yes. because something I, I feel as though we as arts educators are not as adept at is communicating our strategy in the way that we are also doing the same things that others mm -hmm. are doing. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes you will have the question, well, how many of us have arts educators as administrators? And they'll say, well, my principal or my AP has no idea what I do in my classroom. Well, that's our fault because we don't take the time to educate that the same things you look for when you walk into a math class sure. or when you walk into a language arts class mm -hmm. are the same things you're looking for when you come to my class. They just might look different. Yeah. Or you walk into those other classes and say, hey, maybe you should consider doing this differently so it looks more like what's happening in, in the music classroom. Yeah. And so that was something that, that's always been really important for me to show that crossover. Mm -hmm. So it's not just me collaborating with other people who are doing the same thing as I am, although that obviously helps us with different tips and tricks, uh, going to professional learning opportunities, getting in other classrooms, right. having Zoom classrooms where you're teaching each other's ensembles uh, at the same time, like, you know, and just things yeah. like that. It's also having those same collaborative efforts with non-music teachers. Yep. And I, I relate that to the running community, mm -hmm. right? So if I run 5Ks all the time and I run with people who run 5Ks, um, when I start training for a half marathon, what happens to my training if I continue to run with 5Kers, right, right? right? So if I run with the people who are like me all the time, I stunt my own growth mm -hmm. and the perspectives are so much narrower. Yes. So I love, I love, love, love that piece. So before we end our um, time together today, I want to hear some some joy stories. So when I say joy stories, I want you to think back to your um, educational career. And I want you to think of either a student or a colleague or a moment that when you recall it, it brings joy and solidifies your why, why you are who you are today. That why from why to world changer. Yeah. Uh, it's the, the number one story that comes to mind. And I feel like I share it often, but it just, it's, it's such a significant part of why I am the way I am, why I teach the way I teach, 
and honestly why I feel as though others would say that I had an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it, we run that thin line of saying, oh, I, I was an impactful teacher. Well, by whose standards, yeah, right? Sure. And so it, it's, I hesitate to say, oh, I made an impact. But I, I do think that there are others who would, who would suggest mm -hmm. that I was impactful in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so I think about my, my student, I call her my firstborn. Uh, her name is Jaleesa. And she came to me as a freshman in high school and she had been to four different middle schools. Like she, it was transit. I just, it, it was, she was constantly in, in flux, but one, the one consistent piece that she had was, was her saxophone. So when she got to me, uh, I, I'm a big believer and we go slow to go fast. And the very first thing we do is we work on relationships. And so we do an icebreaker that makes the kids as, as awkward as possible. <laughs> Get it all out yes, there. Let's, let's just jump in there. <laughs> and so we play this game called Bird on a Perch. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially musical chairs without the chairs, but like with people. Sure. And so you, you team up. And once the music starts, you have two circles. And once the music starts, they're moving in opposite directions. And when the music stops, the only instruction is that the bird must be elevated off the ground by their perch. Okay. So if you ever want to see students be as creative as possible, give them very limited instructions sure. and just tell them to go. Yep. And so when we, we did the teacher thing where, okay, everybody, does everybody have a pair? Who doesn't have a partner? Raise your hand. And here's Jaleesa over on the side with her hand up. And so I'm like, yeah, it, not participating is not an option. So let's go right. ahead and we're going to connect you. Here's your partner. And you were good to go. Music starts. So as soon as the music starts, I see your eyes go. And so I'm like, oh, she's competitive. <laughs> cool. We got this. We're, um, we're yeah, good. We're bring good. It. <laughs> <laughs> so we get down to two, the last two teams. And her team is one of those teams. And the music starts again. And she's got her eyes zeroed in. And the music stops. And lo and behold, who wins? Jaleesa. Jaleesa. And so she's up, she's hugging her partner, everybody's hugging her. This person who was on the outside of the circle is quite literally now in the middle of what's happening. Yeah. So we go through the rest of our, our day of that band day and I'm sitting at my, my desk after it's all done. I hear a knock on the door and I look up and it's Jaleesa. And she looks at me and she says, Hey, Mr. Graham, uh, I was Mr. back then. Oh, not, no. not doctor. That's right. Just Mr. Graham, hey, but now doctor. I'm the real Dr. Dre. <laughs> I have the degrees, right? Um, and she looks at me and she says, thank you. And I, I'm that person who you can't just tell me thank you or I'm sorry. Right, give me more. You know, I, I gotta have some some a little bit more meat with it. And and I was like, well, for what? And her response, the next thing she said is really what changed my perspective mm -hmm. for the rest of my career. I'm and like still today, on the edge of my seat. <laughs> today is changing it. Uh, but she looks at me and she says, "For giving me a home." Mm. And. It was that moment that I realized that it, the relationship piece, I mean, you think about it, it's like oh, relationships are important. Sure. We hear it all the time, but really we are changing the lives of our students. Well, and that's not to say that she went on and was a perfect child. Like right. we, we had issues and I could tell you a lot of other stories, <laughs> but she, she was able to move forward. Uh, I'm, I'll leave out some of the stories just for, for the sake of time, but they're, her senior year, she was planning to go to the military. She really didn't know what she wanted to do, but that was the guarantee. Mm -hmm. And we had a visiting professor come by. It's like, hey, can you just grab somebody to, to come play for me? I'm, I'm in the area. Mm -hmm. And so she was one of my top performers. So I'm like, hey, yo, come just come get your horn. Come play. <laughs> so she's like, what am I doing? I'm like, no, it's during lunch. Just, just come, come, please come do this for me. Like professionally, I need to right. make this relationship work. So just come do it. So she comes in, gets her instrument. They go into the library, they, they start playing or she starts playing. I'm like, man, this is the worst she has sounded in a long time. So she comes in and she had a habit of just kind of putting her hand over her face like that. And so she walks in and I'm like, I know, let's just wait and hear what he has to say. Like mm -hmm. it, it was, it was bad. Mm -hmm. It was bad. So he comes in and he's looking at her and he's like, we want to offer her a free ride, four year scholarship to Bethune Cookman University. And so this child who wasn't going to college, was going to the military. Now all of a sudden has 180. And so now she's going to a four-year institution. So she was excited, got to call her mom while we were there. So, and which, and we all had a great family relationship. So that we were super excited, but that wasn't where it ends. That's not where the story ends. She went on to BCU was studying music education, was was in the band. She actually is on the the BCU Netflix special that they had. Oh yeah, my gosh, it's it's really cool incredible. to see to see my my kids on yeah. on the big screen, right? And I get a call from her about three years in and she's like, hey Pop, like this is not this really isn't for me. I I I I'm not doing this. And what do you thing. do at that point? Right. Well I, I was like, well okay. I said, you know, that's fine. I, College isn't for everybody. Right. I said you you at least you can say you tried. Mm -hmm. You went in there, you tried to do what you were doing. I said, 
but you can't stop. Mm -hmm. You can stop school, but like, I need to know what's happening. What's going on? Where are you moving? Right. What are you putting in place of that? What I didn't know is that she was going on to pursue a different career. And so about two years later, maybe uh, it's Sunday night, like 1 a.m. Maybe <laughs> I, it, it's I put my phone down. Of course, I just finished planning mm -hmm. for the coming week. Didn't turn it off, though, because we know we have fear of missing out. Right. Don't get FOMO if my Absolutely. phone is off. Absolutely. Like, heaven forbid I miss something while I'm <laughs> sleeping, right? Well, in this case, it actually was true. Mm -hmm. So I get a phone call and I look down and it's and it's her. And in full transparency, I was like, oh, Lord, where's the bail money? Like, yeah. why, why is yeah. she calling me at one in the one morning? One in the morning. So I answer and I hear, Papa, I did it. What I didn't know was that she was she had left college to pursue all the requirements of becoming a nationally recognized emergency medical technician. Oh my gosh. And so she had just found out a few hours earlier that <laughs> she had met that accomplishment. And so she was moving on to literally change the world. Yeah. And it was just such an incredible moment of pride, but that's not where the story ends. So she did that for a while and still just was having a time figuring out and finding herself. Okay. But once again, she, we're still in each other's lives. Mm -hmm. We literally, her birthday is five days after mine. Mm -hmm. So we would celebrate birthdays together. We'd take trips to Universal mm -hmm. and check in on her, like right. firstborn, like what's going on? Yeah. Like, <laughs> How what's we doing? the move? How we yeah. doing? And so now she has found her stride. She is just, I mean, such an incredible, incredible human. She is one of the executive chefs at, I believe, the Hard Rock Cafe, oh the casino gosh. that's right over in Tampa. Yeah. Okay. Cooking, like she sends me videos of like all these steaks on the grill and like the thing. She's Tell cooked me you for, reap the benefits of this at some not point. Quite, okay. Not you quite. You let me know if you need yes. a plus one oh, and we I, will go absolutely. visit Melissa. Yes, <laughs> yes. But she has cooked for celebrities. I, I mean, it has opened so many doors for her. Mm -hmm. And to see her thriving right now is such a... A point of pride. And that's how, that's where I find joy whenever I, just hearing those things that she's doing now. I can't help but go back to your story. And if you hadn't pushed her a little bit with that bird on a perch, like if you <laughs> hadn't, the way you pushed her when she said college wasn't for her and you said, okay, but you're still required to keep going. Mm -hmm. I think that piece where you kept your thumb on her that's how we change the world. Absolutely. Dre, that's incredibly beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for coming today <laughs> and for sharing your joy stories and sharing how we find joy through the art. So I just thank you so much for, you for being in the world <laughs> and for all the people that you are um, impacting and, and showing how to find joy in education. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the Finding Joy in Education podcast. You're listening to episode two, titled Finding Joy Through the Arts. Today, joining us in studio, we have Ajori Spencer, who is our pre-K through 12 performing arts specialist here in Pinellas County, as well as Jonathan Ogle, our pre-K through 12 visual arts specialist supervisor. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here today. I'm so excited about this topic because it's one of those topics that I think every single educator can relate to, right? Because the arts infiltrates everything we do in the classroom. And so I like to start off by asking my guest, what's your story? So if one of you would share first and share your journey to where you are now and where you started. Okay. Um, well, I grew up in a really rural area, um, so not a whole lot going on um, just in terms of things to do. But I always found myself gravitating toward the arts, whether it was, you know, listening to orchestras on the radio or like watching things on TV. I was always gravitating toward that direction. So I ended up participating in band. There weren't really other arts classes mm -hmm. um, in my school system, but I was fortunate to be able to do that. And I realized over time, I was like, okay, I think I want to I want to do this more. I want to be more involved yeah. in this. And I'd always sort of had a passion for teaching. So those things sort of came together. But a lot of my experiences sort of not having a lot of opportunities in the area where I was made me really passionate about creating opportunities yes. 
for students. So, you know, how can we leverage the resources that we have so that on a large scale, we can provide those opportunities for students who might not have that access. So that's really what's driven me and sort of led me. I became a middle school band director. But even in that time, I was always trying to like take on, you know, district projects and sure. things like that. I started the Ignite Camp when I was in the classroom because I said, hey, they don't, there's not really a summer opportunity that's free for our music students. Um, and so I was so fortunate to be able to move into this role and to sort of scale some of those things that I was doing in the sure. classroom. Thank you, Ajori. I love that. I love that your story is rooted in an asset based approach, right? So we can look at the deficits and the things that don't exist, but you looked at it and thought, what opportunities can I create because of these deficits? Right. How can I turn this around and make this better? Yeah. I absolutely love that. Jonathan, what's your story? Well, uh, teaching's in my DNA. So my mother was an art teacher, okay. retired, and my, fa my father was a music teacher. Oh, my God. And so, um, and before that, my grandmother, she was a teacher in the old schoolhouse. I'm, I'm also from a rural area in Iowa, mm -hmm. um, small town. And, uh, you know, um, my mom was uh, our teacher in a different district. So when our uh, when we had days off, I'd go volunteer in her room. And I, you know, really felt like the art room and the music room were uh, kind of my second home. Yes. So I, I grew up in, in that environment. And then uh, as I, you know, of course, took as many art and music classes, I was also in band and vocal uh, choir, things like that. Um, but I decided that art education was really what I what I was interested in. I had a, a really good a, a knack for, for art. And so um, after I graduated college, I taught a year of middle school and high school um, just south of Iowa City. Moved down here in uh, 99, taught about 10 years at Pinellas Central Elementary. Okay. And then I uh, came to the art office and worked as a visual arts coordinator, technology integration. Um, and then uh, about four years ago, I, I assumed this role as visual arts uh, supervisor. So, yeah, it's been an interesting journey. But all throughout that time, um, I enjoy working with uh, students and, and art teachers and helping them to be uh, the best that they can be. I love it. I love when you said that the band and the art room became your home. And some of my fondest memories in high school took place in the choir room. I felt that's where I was me. I was someone else. I was Sarah who was good at reading in my reading class, right? And I was Sarah who knew how to excel in math in the math class. But in the choir room, I was Sarah, period. I didn't have to like be something specific. It was just a place that allowed me to be myself. So I love that you touched on making that your home because I think that's where a lot of our core memories start as well. So we brought these two leaders in today for our Leadership Lens segment because I think it's important for educators to hear what's happening at the district level and beyond and how that trickles down to our classrooms and what that looks like. And so when we think about teachers and, and the multiple hats that they have to wear, what would you say to teachers who are interested in incorporating more arts education, but maybe feel constricted by the confines of the time of the day or the resources, what kind of advice would you give to those teachers? Well, Sarah, I would say um, I, I have firsthand experience with this because my wife is a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> and so um, she's always looking for ways of incorporating art into her, uh, her curriculum, her classroom. Um, and so, you know, it really is just looking for those those opportunities um, where you can uh, visually express yourself or perhaps create, you know, um, utilizing those skills and that knowledge uh, beyond um, retrieval, but actually using them to perhaps do a hands on project to synthesize your learning and help expand that uh, extend that thinking. So. I love it. It like adds layers to the curriculum, exactly. right? So it, it gives that opportunity for every student to have a voice um, and play off their strengths. Right. Ajoy, and reinforce what do you think? that learning. Absolutely. So what do you think? How, what advice would you give to well, the Well, uh, kind of based on what Jonathan was saying, the ironically sort of what I thought of is it increases the size of your palate. Yeah. So really, you're, you know, it. you're, you're, increasing the number of ways that you can reach students. Like I love what you said about feeling different when you were in the mm -hmm. chorus room. And so the question becomes, how can you sort of recreate that feeling? There are some students who might not be excelling in math or might not be Sarah who, you know, is doing well in reading. Right. And if one of their arts classes is one of the only places where they're sort of feeling at home, you can recreate those moments um, in any class. And I think 
you know, all of us as educators are very collaborative. But when I think about arts teachers, by the very nature of the subject, they are some of the most collaborative people. And if you're a little hesitant, I would suggest, you know, uh, reach out to some of the arts teachers in your school and say, hey, you know, I really want to try this. I'm nervous. You know, be very honest. I'm nervous or I don't have any arts experience, but this is something I think could reach some more of my students. Could you help me, you know, get started? And I think so many, so many art teachers would be happy to, to sort of collaborate and, and build those relationships. I love it that, you know, um, we had Dr. Dre Graham on for our previous segment about toy stories. And that is exactly what he touched on was collaboration. Mm. And he talked about opening up his music room as a model classroom and being that person to be the initiator of that conversation. Because as I said earlier, teachers are wearing so many hats. They often get so busy that the arts aren't necessarily at the top of their mind. Right. And so I think though they're willing to collaborate, they just don't know what that looks like. So can you share a little bit of your personal experience of what um, a good model of collaboration would be for a gen ed teacher or a teacher in the classroom with an arts educator? Gotcha. So really what we're talking about, you know, is arts integration. Um, and um, when I think about arts integration, you know, one of the th one of the sort of ending goals is to be hitting both sets of standards. So sure. so on a lo on a lower level, before we get to integration, let's say, for example, you know, we all, for the most part, learned the alphabet through song mm -hmm. and, and it stuck with us. And, I, you know, I even had students, you know, teaching middle school who still they would be singing <laughs> it in their head, trying to find their way. Guilty. Through. <laughs> and that's not that's not integration, but that's the that's a step in the right direction. Um, the the integration part to that would be if we actually cared how we sang the song and we were actually talking about. Let's let's make this sound beautiful and things like that. So so there is really a full spectrum of where we can go. So maybe the first step for someone who is hesitant is is there, you know, is there some way that we can draw this concept and, you know, maybe it's going to click for a student mm -hmm. by, you know, uh, let's say something in uh, in chemistry. Maybe they're not understanding, you know, some of the sort of higher level conceptual sure. things, but maybe if they can draw it out and go through that process, they start to understand the process more. And maybe that's like a first step where we talked about the singing, yeah. you know, of concepts to, you know, to recall information. And then over time, as you get more comfortable, you can move toward, okay, can we address both standards, mm -hmm. sets of standards right. so that um, one is not serving the other, Absolutely. but we're lifting both but of them working up. Working in tandem. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful. Jonathan, do you have anything to add? Sure. Uh, I would say that, you know, uh, really building bridges between, um, you know, the classroom teacher and the arts teachers uh, through, you know, giving them big picture, telling them, hey, these are the things that are coming up, you know, that we're going to be, you know, teaching the students. Um, I know as an elementary art teacher, I would ask classroom teacher, I was like, hey, what are you guys going to be covering, you know, in the next month or two? And, and thinking about how, you know, through my visual arts curriculum, I would be able to perhaps touch on those things. Uh, so I think the communication part is Absolutely. so important. So reaching out to those arts teachers and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. Absolutely. Or looking, or looking for models. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, or ahead. just looking for models. You know, I was visiting Sandy Lane Elementary a couple of months ago, and they had a guest from the Kennedy Center out, and they were doing such a cool project, and it was the intersection of history and jazz and singing, and so the students were learning about jazz and learning about the blues, and they were writing their own blues. Ugh. And so you had the structure of, you know, this is how blues is set up, and we have to have this many of this and this many of this. Do we want things to rhyme? So we were getting into those ELA concepts, you know, we were talking about how they were singing. Okay, does that sound good? We were hitting those music things. Mm. There was all the history lessons of, okay, you know, here's how jazz evolved. And it was just so cool to see these, you know, third, fourth and fifth graders engaged in this multifaceted lesson and not even realizing all the layers and all the standards that they were hitting. And I think that's only going to come when we leverage the expertise of our arts educators, right? And so I'm charging you, if you are an art educator, to be the one to extend the olive branch. Go see your teachers. Ask them, how can I support you? Because we've just heard how important the arts are with, with reaching the full child. So with that in mind, reaching the full child's potential, I always like to find out if there's any joy stories that you have to share. This could be a particular story about a student, a colleague, or a teacher, that when I ask you about how the arts bring joy to education, you think of this particular person. Do either one of you have a joy story that you could share with us today? 
I do. Okay. So, you know, one of the main priorities, and it joys the same way, is we're, we're very involved with trying to recruit and retain, find the best arts teachers for our, for our students mm-hmm. in, in schools. So we work uh, in partnership with, with school leaders and HR. Well, there's a uh, an art teacher that you'll be having on your show here soon, mm-hmm. uh, Rachel Corral, mm-hmm. and she's a fantastic high school art teacher that we nabbed from Naples. Oh, wow. And there was a reason for that. She was, um, you know, content there in her district, uh, but she had heard good things about the arts um, and the support, the level of the high level of support that they they get here in Pinellas County Schools. And so that intrigued her and she looked more into it and she decided to, to, to make the leap. So she lives in St. Petersburg and she's just a phenomenal art teacher. And, and we wouldn't have got her to come to us uh, without the Pinellas County School referendum. So I just have to say how important it. that is, you know, not only for teacher salaries, sure. but also for, you know, supporting the visual arts the performing arts, reading programs, and technology. Excellent. And I look forward to talking with her shortly and hear about her stories. What about you, Ajori? Can you equate a joy story with a particular person? Well, I'll actually share a recent one. You know, we were talking before we started recording about, you know, how hectic sort of, (laughs) you know, December through February is. And so I got here on Monday, fresh from a conference. And one of my first emails was from a former student um, who's uh, currently in high school, Gavin. Shout out to Gavin if he listens to Hi, Gavin. (laughs) (laughs) And um, it was just a short, sweet note where he was like, you know, I was just thinking thinking um, about my time in band in middle school and I hope you're doing well. Like I had such a good time. It was one of my favorite classes and it was just like a great way to start the week. But it was also a reminder to like recenter me. You know, I came back Monday and, you know, a bunch of emails to go through. And I was like, but we do it for this reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. Staying connected to that why. Yeah. And remembering that there are students behind this work that right. we do. And I think for all of our art teachers or teachers in general, but um you know, we know that every student that's in our classes isn't going to go on to be a professional musician or professional visual artist necessarily. Some will. Um, and I don't I don't actually even know if he's still involved in band. I know he got really involved in um, athletics, but he became someone who has a deeper appreciation yes. for music, who's still connected with music, who's still clearly, you know, reflecting on those experiences. And that's the joy that we get to create for the students. Um, and it was a, such a joyous way for me to start my week to, to just center myself and say, OK, yes, I have 100 emails right sure, now, but, but it's in why. service to, to this. I and, love it. So yeah. we're going to end our time together um, with one more question, and that is simple. How do the arts bring joy to education? So if you could answer that in a few sentences and sum up all your thoughts on how do the arts bring joy to education? Jonathan? Just the process uh, of making art. I mean, you know, you walk into Barnes & Noble and you'll see one of the first sections is uh, coloring books. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just from simple coloring books to, you know, going out with friends and and painting by numbers or uh, just just the process of, of making art and how... Uh, not only cathartic that is, but also how you can express yourself through that piece. Yes. And that joy is, is happening right now in all of our, our art classroom, arts classrooms throughout the district. And we're so fortunate that we have elementary art weekly and we have our arts courses in the middle school and high school level. But that joy then of producing that that art, some of that art goes on to be exhibited at some of our uh, partner uh, museums and art yes. centers. And yeah. the joy of seeing the students and their family and friends coming and viewing this work and being recognized for the visual arts achievements is just outstanding. And I, I just, I look forward to every single uh, reception and award ceremony. I love that that, those opportunities for our students. That's incredible. Ajori, how do the arts bring joy to education? I think it's really about connectivity and community. Mm. You know, when we think about literally any society, any culture through history, they have always found a way to make art. And so it tells us that in the the very like core of our being as humans, there's like there's this desire to find a way to express ourselves, to find a way to to sort of be free. So when I think about um, how you open, you said, you know, art um, infiltrates everything. I think that's sort of the it. Um, It's joyous because it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're walking through campuses and we see murals and we hear, you know, we hear music, we see, you know, students dancing. It's 
it's a it's a kind of freedom and expression that um, we need as educators that the students yeah. need. Um, we need that outlet throughout that day. So I think it's it's just a reminder um, of our need for community and our ability to create that community. I absolutely love that. So if you were not convinced before, I hope you are convinced now that we need the arts in our schools, we need the arts in our classroom, and we need that collaboration with our expertise in our building. So thank you so much again for joining me today. That wraps up our segment on our leadership lens. I thank you, Ajori and Jonathan, for lending us your expertise and your advice for our teachers. And we can't thank you enough for the leadership in this district. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Finding Joy in Education podcast. You are joining us now for our segment called Finding Joy in Education. During this segment, we talk to educators who are out in the field doing the work. And today, with our focus on finding joy through the arts, I've brought into the studio Mr. David Martinez Cooley. He is a music teacher here in Pinellas County at Lila Davis Elementary. He also happens to be the 2020 Pinellas County Teacher of the Year. I also have Rachel Corral. She is a 2D and photography teacher, as well as the visual, art, visual arts department chair at St. Petersburg High School here yes. in Pinellas County. So David, Rachel, thank you for joining us today on our show. I start every single segment with a question and I want to know what's your story. So David, would you share with us your journey of education? Absolutely. I think uh, nature and nurture for me, getting into the teaching profession. My mother is a longtime elementary physical, physical education teacher in Pinellas County, and all four of her children are either currently teaching or have taught in the oh, past. Oh, wow. So, uh, and three in Pinellas County. And so you uh, didn't have a choice. No, like, it's, it's, cute. it's in you the didn't blood. Have a choice. Not, <laughs> not sure what dad did wrong, that nobody <laughs> wanted to do business. Um, but then I certainly remember in high school helping folks out with their math homework. So I was, if you don't know, I was a former secondary math teacher and uh, on the bus to my sister's away basketball and volleyball games, helping folks out with their homework. And I realized helping people get through those problems mm -hmm. or just showing them how I did my work or getting the right answer. So I knew going into college that I thought math education was where I would be. And then I figured I'll be that cool math teacher that like hangs out Friday night at the football game with <laughs> yeah. the band or the chorus. <laughs> Um, and then at some point, I just figured I had it wrong. I needed to be mm. that music was my passion. And then I'd be the cool music teacher that could help you with your trig homework. Oh, I all. love yeah. it. Nice. Totally so, flipped the script yeah. on that. So and but I still thought I'd be secondary. And then I did one semester in elementary and realized that's where I needed to be. And that's where I've been ever since. I love it. That's mm. great. Rachel, what's your story? So I grew up in Naples, Florida, which is not too far from here. And just a flash forward to high school, I was playing all these sports. I had three varsity letters. I was in band. I played saxophone. Shout out. No. <laughs> um, and at the time I was in AP art, I didn't want art to define me. I never wanted to go to school for art, nor was education in my future. Mm -hmm. um, my senior year, I won a art scholarship on a whim oh, at, a, wow. at an art museum. And that kind of opened everything for me. I ended up working at the museum under the education curator. And I went to University of Tampa. And my story is my mother said, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. So I followed that. I went undeclared art major, ended up really falling in love with art history and kind of continued my studies. I double majored in fine arts, concentration in art history, independent studies in oil painting and sculpture. And then I studied abroad. I started to travel. I've been to 35 countries now. Wow. And um, I came back and I decided, okay, I'm going to work in museums and I'm going to get my master's degree. So I got my graduate degree at Ohio State in museum education and art education. And um, my first teaching job was in elementary school. And I decided, okay, I'm living home. I should pick up a job and not just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, graduate school was very expensive. Sure. And that was the year of 2019, 2020. Mm. So uh, my very first year, I went online and had to learn virtual teaching platforms at the same time. And it was a lot. I quickly learned elementary was not it. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed it, but sure. not, <laughs> not for me. So COVID was honestly a blessing for me. It um, took out a lot of the older art teachers and allowed me to move up into secondary very quickly. So my second year teaching, I got into high school and just started teaching from there. And I've never looked back. 
I love it. I love how you took something that could have been negative and you found opportunities there yeah. that land you right where you're supposed to be. Exactly. I love it. it I all love it. Out. So we are talking about how the arts bring joy to education. And so I wanted to get your take from both of you. How do the arts bring joy to education and what are some of the benefits of incorporating art? So Rachel, I'm going to start with you. How do the arts bring joy? So just to start of the importance of what art education is and art advocacy, um, you see anything from using scissors to drawing to using rulers, hand-eye coordination, the crossover from mathematics to science, all of these things are incorporated into art and it's extremely extremely important um, in terms of integrating it into, you know, regular classrooms or the difference in that is I like to really talk about cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. We we have to create a space where these kids can see themselves and have self-identity. When I first started teaching, you know, when you give a, a little kid a, a pencil and you say draw a self-portrait, how do they edit it in a way? What skin tones are they using? Mm -hmm. Are they drawing glasses? Mm -hmm. We're all born with, you know, 10 fingers, 10 toes, how do we cultivate a space where this kid can, you know, learn from that and, and move forward and um, all of these things and how to properly educate, uh, you know, classroom teachers about what cultural appropriation yes. really is. We learn about Native Americans, we learn about this stuff and you think you're going to teach through it through art. Okay, you know, let's make feather headbands and let's talk about this, but that's not giving them an identity. Mm -hmm. How can we introduce artists that are multicultural, different backgrounds, women artists, yeah. all of this stuff that these kids need to see themselves in at a young age. I love it. David, how do the arts bring joy to education? Well, I think it's life. I think, you know, he, we're human and we get joy through the arts. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's adult coloring books and yeah. adult painting classes and mm -hmm. community choruses. And so I think it makes so much sense to bring that to children at the, at the youngest age for my case and then as they grow up. Um, so the fact that we make sure that, at least in Pinellas County, elementary students are guaranteed that that mm -hmm. one, once a week art, once a week music, physical activity outside, that they're getting that. And then to your point, that is, for some of them, that is might be the reason they come to school. That yes. might be their happiness mm -hmm. that day and why they're there. So the fact that we make sure they get that and that, that complete education, I think, mm -hmm. is so important. Yeah, we've heard a resounding answer of community when I asked yeah. that question, that it For brings sure. community. So yeah. when we talk about bringing that community to a school, since you're both school-based teachers, how do you collaborate with the gen ed teachers at your school? How do you encourage incorporating arts into the curriculum? So it's really important to state that at most schools, there's only one of us. Mm. So um, we we always joke, this is a fun story, that every Tuesday we PLC. So it's me, theater, music, band, and avid. I call us the black sheep <laughs> of, the, of the school. And, and yeah, we're supposed to sit in there and talk about how do we close the data gap? And, mm -hmm. okay, how's your keyboard class? <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting because it's a double-edged sword where we don't have people telling us what to do. But at the same time, we're on this privatized island where sure. there's nobody to reach out for help. So, of course, we work with theater. And, you know, I could give you the professional answer. Yeah, we'll do some theater backdrops or, sure, band and we'll pair for a concert and we'll do some arts. But the truth of the matter is, is the support that we have for each other that we're really just checking in like hey how'd your concert go you know are mm -hmm. you winning all state are you how's your how's your theater going and and the biggest push is sending mass emails to the school mm -hmm. hey look at all these you know we just had the dolly art show you know yes. look at all these entries that got in it's pushing 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 your program it's just banging on the door 24 7 sure. to get people to look at you yeah there's only one of us right so in terms of collaborating yeah i mean it's more support and mental health among our community but it's also Pinellas County that gives us mentors and all of these amazing teachers that we have in high school, secondary and Jonathan and all of these, you know, outreach programs that we have that really help me. I love it. I love that you tap into your resources, mm -hmm. right? That you show that not only do you have a community at your school, but there's a larger community at play as well. And I, and I think that's really great. David, what's your take on collaboration? We'll start with at your site and then I'll ask you both about collaborating within the department with each other. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, the site, it, it's a delicate balance with elementary because 
uh, for, for example, a grade level concert, you've got all the second graders and, and they're just going to perform a concert. So for that, it's amazing that those second graders are seeing all of their teachers in the front row yeah. mm -hmm. and they're, oh, oh, wow, look, look what we did. Mm -hmm. It's also great for them to know that maybe the one that struggles in math or reading is a soloist yes. at the concert yeah. or, you know, wants, wants to be in front of everyone where they might not want to do that mm -hmm. in their general ed class. Um, but then there's also the opposite. We have chorus, which pulls away from their instruction time. So we have to advocate also for those same students. Yes, that, yes they're missing a little bit of math. But mm -hmm. I promise you what they're getting 45 mm -hmm. minutes a week in band or chorus or whatever it is um, could be the difference for that student. And when we put everything together, it is that same that support. So I had three students at Allstate. When they come back to school on Friday, I was still in Tampa. And I'm telling those teachers, <laughs> you don't understand. There was like 12 Pinellas County students there. And you have three of them yeah. in your fifth grade class. It's amazing. So just make sure that you recognize that they, they're superstars. We're, mm -hmm. They call us specials in yeah. elementary school. But I say we're not we're not special. We're spectacular. Oh, I and love that's, it. And that's what, what the kids can do when mm -hmm. they come to us. Yeah. And I think like what Rachel said, it's bringing awareness to mm -hmm. it. It's making sure that they know you exist and, and the power behind it. Mm -hmm. So how do you collaborate then outside of your school with teachers who do teach the same content as you? If you're not housed in the same building, what does that collaboration look like? So the one fun thing about what we do, right, is that we're creative problem solvers. <laughs> so we're, we're the best at what we do. Um, for seeing other teachers, um, we do anything. We actually get together, all of us South County uh, teachers. We try to really meet up outside of the hours, go to the shows, see what's happening, um, professional developments, do PLCs with just AP teachers. And mm. the, the logistics of this county, because it's so large, Right. So we have North County, right. Middle South. So kind of putting in we put in so much extra time that I don't think people see that, sure. um, you know, with shows and concerts and all of these things that are happening. So um, really communicating and doing mentor programs and and just, you know, I had a mentor last year um, from Lakewood, Sandra Bourne. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, she's one of the best people I've ever met. That's and awesome. just being able to text her 24 seven. Like, yeah. hey, how do I mat? this frame for, you know, not all this stuff and, and just getting everything ready that it's such a tight knit community. And that's one of the things I think about Pinellas County mm -hmm. is that they have their pulse on yeah. arts education yes. and it is a priority. Mm -hmm. So you'll see on our social media when there are concerts and when there are programs and museum exhibits, they make sure that that spotlight is on academics, but also arts, because I really believe they go hand in hand mm -hmm. for the full child. Yeah, absolutely. right. David, what about collaboration for you when you meet with other music teachers that aren't at Lila Davis, what does that look like for you? Yeah, it's fantastic. I'd echo what you said about the mentor program. Um, I'm not sure about visual arts, but performing arts, we have a mentor cadre that the new teachers stay in for three years. Oh, wow. So the, you know, sometimes you get that first year bump and then good luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm still, you know, working with new teachers who started two or three years ago, but also just the beg, bar, and steal method. <laughs> uh, that's another, We're good at that. Yes. And I think with music that I, you know, 2020 was horrible, but learning Nearpod, mm. I mean, just last month, right. somebody, hey, here are my sub plans for FMEA. Boom, beg, you know, take what yeah. you want, leave what you don't. We can get, we can, we are teams call away from every other mm -hmm. teacher and the music teacher in the county mm -hmm. and, and a, a Nearpod click away from sharing a, a quality lesson. That's so fantastic. Yeah. And one more extra segment on that that I forgot to mention. Um, every year they do an FAEA, Florida Art Educator Association conference. Mm -hmm. And we get the opportunity in Pinellas County um, kind of sponsors us to go if we teach a workshop. And so I taught a sold out workshop this year was in um, Ponte Vedre. And all of us show up, every art teacher that can go in uh -huh. the state of Florida. Wow. And it's a whole collaboration. Yeah. So there's a lot of inner workings involved, not just in Pinellas, but in the state. And just keeping up with those conferences and district-wide trainings. And we host two every, um, one in fall and one in spring. So we'll have a spring district-wide coming up. And they pick a museum. So ours is going to be at the James Museum. So we get to go not only be in that space, but we get to learn how to teach in that space. And then we get to know how to bring those kids on field trips back to those places. I love it. I love when our networks expand beyond our county because I think that's the true value mm -hmm. of connectivity is knowing 
when you don't know the answer, I know someone who does, yeah. right? I might sure. not know, but I know someone in Collier <laughs> right. who I can reach out to that has that answer. Right. So as we wrap up our segment, I want to end with some joy stories. And so when I ask you to share a joy story, I want you to think of either a student, a colleague, an administrator, somebody that you have a success story with. So when I ask you how education brings joy to you, this is one of those core memories that pop up for you. Um, Rachel, would you start us off and share a joy story for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of my main preps that I teach is photography, which I tell the, the kids, this is a skill life course. You will get Photoshop certified, you will graduate, and you can have a full career if you want at 18. Mm -hmm. And I've had four kids do it already. Um, so last year was my first year here at St. Pete High. And um, I was launching my photography and kind of flipping over the old program and bringing in the new. Sure. And I had a photo one student. She was a freshman um, and she had just moved here from Estonia five years ago. And she had never picked up a camera, taught her everything from scratch. And she took this amazing picture that was about her country and her home life. Um, it was about the Ukrainian and Russian war. Oh, wow. And it ended up hitting at the regional level for Scholastics. And it went all the way up to win a national gold. Um, she was an American uh, visionary nominee. And oh we got to travel together to New York City to Carnegie Hall. And this is one of those kids that that just changed her life. Yes. So now she um, wants to go to college and, and, you know, pursue art and do all these amazing things. And that's why I do what I do. I can what we teach is life skills and, and things that can just change in a minute and in a second. You know, they win that one show, they win that one scholarship, and then that's their whole career. I love it. I have a goosebumps thinking about how her life has changed from that one opportunity mm -hmm. that you saw that you presented yeah, for her. Like, exactly. Incredible. David, do you have a joy story? Yeah, well, now I have two. Okay. <laughs> just reminded me of my, the student who introduced me uh, at the Teacher of the Year ceremony was a senior in high school. And some people mm. are like, oh, you didn't choose one of your own students. But he was the first um, Allstate student I had at Davis. Mm. So I had come in as the chorus teacher. So he's fifth grade. Right. I didn't get him into Allstate. He had a wonderful voice. But then years, luckily he had younger siblings. So I was still connected with the family. And, oh, he's still doing music in middle school. Mm -hmm. Oh, he made Allstate in high school. We never thought he would have been in a praise band at church, and he is. So just hearing from them, because sometimes you don't get that. From, in an, as an elementary sure, teacher, right. you don't know that they're singing in a college right, choir. Right. So the fact that I was I connected with him and just knew that that had changed his life, and that's mm -hmm. what he said when mm -hmm. he introduced me. But we also have in elementary the day-to-day, week-to-week, you're my favorite teacher, this yeah. is my favorite class. Yeah. <laughs> but the one that I always tell that I'll try to tell without getting choked up is <laughs> seeing a parent in the main office and uh, signing the student in late. So the student goes back, and I'm checking my box or something, and she said, Mr. Martinez, I just have to let you know we were at her grandpa's funeral this morning. And uh, we were going to spend the day, have a nice lunch. But she said, no, I have to go to school. It's my music day. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so it's like, every, you know, you teach an elementary 110, 120 sure. students a day. Mm -hmm. Odds are one of those 100 kids needs that that day. Yeah. So mm -hmm. every single day you have to be that the joy for, for all of those kids. And mm -hmm. and how the arts bring joy to our students. So, I mean, we talked a lot about how it brings us joy. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, that trickles down to joy for our students, which they deserve. Absolutely. Our students deserve to find joy. Yep. So mm -hmm. Every day. Beautiful, beautiful. David, Rachel, thank you so much for thank joining so us thank today. You. Listening to Finding Joy in Education, we're ready to begin our segment called Teach Hacks. Joining me today in the studio, I have guest Pamela Richardson. Listen to this bio. Pamela is the Arts Magnet Coordinator slash Conservatory Director at Sandy Lane Elementary Conservatory of the Arts, and she also serves as an instructional staff developer here in Pinellas County. Pamela, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. You know, today's episode is Finding Joy Through the Arts. And I just thought you would be the perfect person for this segment on our hacks for integrating the arts into curriculum. But before we dive into that, I ask every guest, what's your story? My story begins in Chicago, Illinois, South Side. Um, young girl who always loved school, but never had music classes until high school, and became a music educator um, later in life. Um, began the year 
the, the career in the district in 97, taught 12 years North County, 12 years South County. Nice. For equal. So 20, <laughs> balance it out. Balance it out. 24 years. And then um, took on the job that I currently have now for Sandy Lane Elementary Conservatory for the Arts. Also have um, my certification in educational leadership, master's in educational leadership, did some doctorate work in educational organizational leadership. And I use all of that. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, I mentored teachers in South County wow. um, for eight years. So I use all of my training and my experiences in the job that I currently have now, where I lead a team of five teachers in the conservatory, but I'm also the coach for the school to help the school um, understand how to integrate the arts into the curriculum. I absolutely love it. That leads me right into my very first question. You know, since this segment is about hacks, I want to know what's your hack for collaborating with teachers but also school administrators and how to integrate the arts seamlessly into overall curriculum. So I know that's a lot. So what are your hacks for getting that job done? Right away, I'm thinking about two R's. Okay. The first one being relationships. You can't do anything unless you have relationships with people where they can build trust with you, where you can lead and guide them in directions that may be a little uncomfortable. Sure. And then the other R that I'm thinking of is um, the capacity to be able to relate. Yes. So, and, and then reflection as well. I should say three R's. So using all those things in my toolbox, I'm able to take teachers to places where they don't normally live. Mm. Creation is the highest cognition level. And when you're dealing with the arts, students are already operating in a higher cognition level. So being able to, well, I have a, a, the hack for me is to speak the teacher's language. Yes. So I study all the ELA standards, math standards, science standards to be able to communicate the verbiage that they need to understand their content area. But then I also have to have a command of the standards and the vocabulary and the arts and then I have to marry the two to be able to reach them. So that's one of the hacks. Pamela, you hit the nail on the head speaking the teacher language. It's one thing when teachers hear from somebody that comes in, maybe a staff developer, and gives them these ideas, but it's outside of the realm of what they're doing in the classroom. It sounds like what you do is instead of adding to the plate, you make arts the plate, right? Like everything is here. You already have it. Let me mm -hmm. show you how this works. Absolutely. Absolutely. When we were doing um, shadow puppetry with Daniel Barrage from the Kennedy Center for the Arts, um, we used it for theme in ELA. Mm. And we also used shadow puppetry with uh, math. Under the students were struggling with math problems, word problems. So can you imagine students in first grade behind a screen with flashlights and being able to work math problems using the props that they've made and using the shadows and directional pieces from the art form that they're studying to be able to solve the math problem? The things that they learned stayed with them for a, a very long time. Oh, I'm sure. And I'm sure the student engagement in those classrooms are is then through the roof, as well as ownership, right? So when yes. students are creating mm -hmm. to help cement that learning, the ownership is going from teacher to student. And I just think that that is what the arts do. So in your role, how do you work to ensure that the arts education is also accessible and inclusive for all students, regardless of background or abilities. Because I know I'll hear teachers say, well, that's just not for my students. That's not for these kids. So how do you make sure, what's your hack for making arts accessible and inclusive? Well, being that we are a magnet school, um, it's very easy for someone to say haves and have nots because we're a school within a school. So I work very hard not to have this group over here get one thing in the other group doesn't get anything. So what we are doing at our school, first of all, every child has access to both dance, both music teachers, both visual arts and the dance teacher. Yes. All the students have the opportunity to take focus groups. 
focus groups is where they have a more intense study of a particular area of mm. the arts. All the students in the magnet program have an arts integration teacher where that teacher is responsible for the the same content that their colleagues are teaching, but they also add arts products at the end of lessons to be able to see how students are mastering the, the content that's being taught to them. So it, it's everywhere. Students have access. For everyone. For everyone. And I love that you spoke about teachers as well. So it's not just as access for students to the materials and the resources, but it mm -hmm. sounds like you've made it even so that all teachers also have access to that, which is just absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. I love it. We, we flew someone in to teach the teachers theater strategies, which actually helped, helped the teachers with um, problem solving and um, some of the other areas that they were working in with student engagement. Mm -hmm. And um, we had them doing tableaus which is a, pic a living picture and showing them how they can use a tableau to find out if students understood the content that they taught and like in preparation for a test, um, they can see evidence of their understanding by the way they, they work with each other in the tableau. I love it. Uh, that's so incredible. So on my last question to you, I love to fill our time with sharing joy stories. And so Pamela, a joy story is a story that you think of that grounds you in your why, why you are still in education. And it might be a student, a colleague, um, an administrator, somebody that you had an experience with that you think back on with joy. And it reminds you of why you are still in education. Would you share an example of a joy story with us before we go? Okay, my joy story. Mm -hmm. Roxanne Stevenson, Chicago, Illinois. She was the only African-American band director in the city. And so happened to be my band director. Mm -hmm. And um, it came time for me to go to college, and I did not go. My father had fallen ill, and I felt, I'm the only girl, oldest girl. I'm going to stay home and mm -hmm. work for the family. And she found out, knocked on my door, said, no, mm -hmm. I need you to go to school. You can help your family better there. So got on the Greyhound bus. <laughs> Headed to Daytona Beach. Wow. Began my studies at Bethune Cookman University. Yes. And that is where I became a music educator. And that is what led me here. Yes. If it wasn't for the knock on the door, I would not be sitting in this chair today. That's beautiful. And because of her, I was able to impact somewhere in the thousands for students who have come before me uh -huh. over the years because she helped me to change my mind. I love it. I love when we hear one teacher change the trajectory. And often we share the stories of how we've done that, but to reflect and say who did that for us and then to pay it forward for every student that comes into contact with us, that's the true power of how the arts bring joy to education. Well, Pamela, thank you for joining us today. We're so grateful that you took time out to share your stories, thank you. to share your expertise. And I cannot wait to continue to follow your journey and see all that you accomplish here in Pinellas County and beyond. So thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to Finding Joy in Education and our episode today on Finding Joy Through the Arts. If you have any questions, comments, or would like to be a guest on our podcast, you may email us at podcast at pcsb.org. As you leave, I asked some of my friends from across the country to answer the prompt, how do the arts bring joy to education? So I would like you to listen to our art educators from around the world who have answered that question for you. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Rhea Francani and I am FAU's District Teacher of the Year 2023. I am the performing arts teacher at A.D. Henderson University School at FAU for grades six through eight. And I think that the arts bring so much joy to education. The arts provide an outlet for students to express themselves. Students have opportunities to collaborate with each other in creative and in innovative ways. They can build something together. Students are impacted in positive and meaningful ways through the arts. 
Moments are created in class or on stage that can become memories that last a lifetime. I have seen life-changing experiences happen right here in my classroom. I've seen students conquer their fears, discover talents, skills, support each other, build relationships and friendships through music, believe in one another, and most importantly, believe in themselves. Hello, my name is Andrew Burke. I am the 2023 St. John's County District Teacher of the Year. The arts bring joy to education because the arts gives students a place to immediately create and to enjoy their creations. The power of having students create in any art class or any fine arts class immediately gives students confidence and it gives them teamwork skills when they're working together on their different creations. And the arts are all about enjoying life. And through arts classes, we help teach students some of the best ways to enjoy life and to create. Hi, my name is Christy Bassett, the 2015 Florida Teacher of the Year. I am an art educator and instructional coach. And I am here today at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, France walking around surrounded by the works of Monet, Manet, Van Gogh, Seurat, Renoir. I am reminded of the joy of art and education. Over 30 years ago in Polk County Schools, I had an incredible art teacher named Mr. Burt. He opened up the world of art to me and art has brought me everywhere. The most important place that art has brought me is into the art classroom, where students created works that have brought me the most joy in education. Hi, my name is James Young, and I am Missouri State Teacher of the Year for 2022. I believe that music education brings joy to students because it allows them an opportunity to, to laugh and smile in a way that they may not be able to outside of the walls of the classroom, and even despite some of the things that may be going on elsewhere um, in their lives or even in school, it's a place where they can come together and create and have community and feel a sense of belonging, which is really important in this life journey at all stages of life. My name is James Young and I teach music education K through eight joyfully. Hi, my name is Jonathan Jervich. I'm an elementary art teacher and the 2018 Ohio Teacher of the Year. And actually one of the reasons that I became an art teacher to begin with is because I wanted to bring joy to students and to their education. I grew up the child of two artist parents and our whole lives were filled with the joy that comes from creative exploration, from rolling out huge pieces of paper in the living room and making art together and making messes and then cleaning them up. And I wanted to bring that to other kids. I wanted them to have the experiences and the joy that I had as a kid. Um, and that's what I try to do every day. In this, my 19th year of teaching, Every morning I get up and I think about what are the enriching, exciting experiences that I can bring to kids that make them discover themselves, discover the world, and in the process to laugh and to smile and to see challenges as opportunities and to find joy. Hello, my name is Kim King and I'm an elementary art teacher in Mansfield, Connecticut, and I'm the 2022 Connecticut State Teacher of the Year. Um, as an arts teacher, I have such a privilege to get to witness um, so much pure joy from my students. And I think that the seeds of that joy are planted in the creative process. The creative process is this unique place where students get to take the beginnings of an idea and experiment and explore and make mistakes where mistakes are celebrated and where students can collaborate and try out different ideas. Um, the art room is where students get to find their artistic voices and they can share pieces of their um, lived experiences, their traditions, their stories, their emotions. Um, and it is through that uh, community building and um, trust that's that's created in an art classroom um, that students really get to be themselves. And that there, I think, is where um, 
the joy is allowed to blossom. Hello, my name is Mark Daniels. I am the 2022 Utah Teacher of the Year, and I teach high school theater. When I was given the prompt, how do the arts bring joy to education? It came on a day when I had just finished a CLT meeting, a PLC meeting, a faculty meeting, and had a 504 meeting, and it had been a frustrating morning. But then I went to rehearsal after school. We're in the middle of a show, and yesterday we had worked hard with some kids, and and they'd they'd memorized their lines. We were blocking a scene, and we'd worked on motivations and objectives and what creating tactics uh, to create those characters. And I started rehearsal by saying, okay, let's review what we did yesterday. I sat in the back of the auditorium and said, action. And I watched magic happen. I watched these kids bring these characters to life. They found tactics to obtain their motivations and obtain their objectives that just made me so happy. And when it was done, I jumped up and said, that's what it's all about. Do you feel it? And they were excited and I couldn't have been more proud of what they had accomplished. I couldn't have been more proud of them and, and their choices. And I was so excited. So the next three hours, we finished the rehearsal and had an amazing, amazing time. I was so proud of those kids. Education comes first. They've got to keep their grades up. They've got to keep their attendance up. They've got to do everything in order to stay active in the arts. But it's the arts in education that brings the joy, so much joy. I love the memories made in, a, in creating a show. I love the excitement of an opening night. I love the tears of joy on a closing night because they have made memories that will last a lifetime. Education needs the arts. And my favorite quote is from J.M. Barry, the author of Peter Pan. He said, God gave us memories that we might have roses in December. And that's what the arts in education bring us. They give us those roses. I hope you have a great day. Hi, I'm Todd Eckstein, the 2023 Alachua County Teacher of the Year. And I teach orchestra and band at Abraham Lincoln Middle School in Gainesville, Florida. When asked how the arts bring joy to education, from my experience, participation in the arts gives students opportunities to create something tangible that is entirely and wholly a product of their own imagination and efforts, which then can be shared with others. Hi, I'm Tim Ferguson, 2024 Sarasota County Teacher of the Year, and I teach music at Garden Elementary in Venice, Florida. When asked about the joy that comes from teaching arts education, it's easy to see why we call this a special. At the elementary level, every single student gets a chance to work in these special things, and we want it to be something that they look forward to. But I think there's some sneak attack learning that happens as well. See, when they're learning about rhythms, there's math elements that are going on there. When we're talking about sound production, that's all science. And of course, as we're talking about lyrics or reading things, next thing you know, music and the ELA component are so connected. Music also has this power of bringing people together. You start off and you have your own individual part, and then you're collectively working together. That doesn't happen when you're having a math test. The person next to you might be doing wonderful, and if you're struggling, that doesn't affect you at all. But in this collective experience of music, we're all working together to make the same goal at the end. Of course, there's all those, non those essential things as well, like teaching grit, determination, perseverance, self-reliance, getting a chance to notice that things are not just gonna happen overnight. Remember, it is a marathon, not a sprint. And the arts allows us to easily visualize and hear those changes through the course of a student's life. So it's, I don't think it's a special thing. I know when they talk about saying it's a non-core subject, I think music is so important for what we do every day in school. And I'm very blessed to be able to do it here at Garden Elementary. Hi, I'm Jean Reynolds. How do the arts bring joy to education? Well, the arts are joy. They're what makes us human. The arts fires on all cylinders of the whole child, the brain, the heart, the body, the brain, because there's lots of cognitive challenges and ways to connect subjects and takes real critical thinking. The heart, because the arts make us feel and the arts give ways to communicate when words fail. And the body, because you, you can't make art without using your physical being, whether you're dancing, 
playing an instrument, you're singing, you're acting, you're sculpting. It's in the whole being, it takes all of you. For centuries, people have communicated through the arts. It is what makes us human. So how do the arts bring joy? It's why kids come to school every day, to go to that class, to connect with being human, to communicate their stories, who they are. Indeed, the arts bring great joy to all students. Hi, I am Frank Garaitonandia, Volusia County's Teacher of the Year 2022, and I teach art at Citrus Grove Elementary in Deland, Florida. I find joy every day in teaching my students to make connections with the world around them. Much of the world is defined by its culture, by its architecture, by its music, by its dance, and by its art. And it is the arts that are that superpower that give, help our students to develop confidence, creativity, and learn to celebrate multiple perspectives and learn that there is more than one solution to a problem. The arts help our students to have a complete education. Let them create.